warm my heart still after years and years. Interestingly, I've had three fellows pass away from different things. But yeah, it's no one of them was in a plane crash going to Mexico to do cleft surgery. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We are in season four and we are digging for gold. We really want to get the nuggets out of these guys from all around the world. And in my episode for today, the guest has come all the way from the United States of America, none other than Jonathan Sachs. It's great to be here. Jonathan, we've been trying to get this together for quite a while. I'm thrilled. I mean, I, I remember probably more than 10 years ago, it was the first time I met you over there, and I was like amazed by this guy who's just doing this incredible work in facial plastic surgery. So maybe by kicking off, tell the listeners a little bit more about who you are, where you're based, what do you get up to? Well, I, I, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and I uh, went to college all on the East Coast of the United States and slowly migrated to California. Yeah. And now I practice in two cities in California, Half of my week is in Northern California, um, where I have purchased a winery and fl that has flourished for me. We'll talk about that maybe. Yeah, yeah. I want to know all about that. And then half of my week is in Beverly Hills. At a later part of my career, I decided to impart on something new. And I opened an office in Beverly Hills, which I'm not sure is the best idea, yeah, yeah. but uh, the uh, maybe it's not the best financial idea, but I really love practicing down there. So I practice half of the week in Sacramento. I fly to, to Beverly Hills mm -hmm. and practice the second half of the week. And I do that every week. Really? Because I, I travel to Joburg once a week, mm -hmm. but I fly up in the morning, consult or operate, fly back. So it's interesting. So how, how far is the distance between the two? It's, it's an hour flight, maybe a six hour drive, but I never drive. <laughs> I only fly. Sure. Yeah. And, and that, so that's quite interesting. And so you're operating in both facilities as well? I see patients in both facilities. I inject in both facilities. And I operate in both facilities. So I have two offices, which is not, uh, sometimes they say the, the way to have things the most honed down is to have one office in yeah. one place. But this gives me diversity. It makes me happy to be in both places. So it's, it's been good. Yeah, but I mean, I've never struck, like meeting you, I've never, it's never struck me as you guys just doing one thing the whole time. Yeah. I mean, I think it's quite cool to have two different offices. And, yeah. and you have a third office. Is your wine farm. Yeah, that's, that's my third office. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that extensively. Maybe that wasn't the best financial thing, but it's been a great thing for me. <laughs> so actually... Most of my career, I was at a university in Sacramento, University of California, Davis. Okay. Okay. And I spent a majority of my career there and, the, and then opened this office in Beverly Hills after I stopped at the university. Yeah. That's what I did with the rest of my week. But one of the things I loved about the university were the challenge of the cases that I had. And it didn't just have me do aesthetic surgery, although I did a lot of that. And I love aesthetic surgery. Mm -hmm but I did reconstructive surgery in cleft lip and palate, and I did a lot of jaw movement surgery. Yes. So I, I really sort of tested what I think was all of the form and function of the face yeah. to make the form and function the best, because yeah. that's why we do things. We want to make the form the best. Yes. We want to make people aesthetically look the best, but we also want to make them function the best. Sometimes their teeth aren't aligned. And of course, you're a big nose surgeon, and you know that form and function in the nose is really yes. important. So I look at both those things. And uh, I've also gotten to do a lot of trauma surgery. I, you know, cleft lip and palate congenital problems are sort of at the heart of what makes me tick a little bit. Even though I do less of them now, yeah. I, I love doing them. And I love, I still take uh, mission trips to go and do uh, surgery on people in other parts of the world wow. because it's fulfilling. Yes, yes. It, and, and one thing that's wonderful about medicine, we can take it in many directions. We all get a doctorate in medicine, but we can take it in so many ways. We can teach. Uh, and because people in medicine want to constantly learn, there's always this ability to teach. So I think at first I'm a teacher. But you also run a, you've got a fellow who works with you, isn't it? I have a fellow, yeah. I've had over 30 fellows. Wow. 
and I've had one every year that I've been in practice. So I've had almost 35 fellows. And does that does the fellow travel with you or not? They do. Wow. When things are interesting, I, I look at a fellowship as something that is for them. Their residency is for both them and, and service, yes. but fellowship is to, is to learn. And so when I have something that's good, they travel, and when it's not, I keep them in one place and they study or they, yeah. they work just in my practice in Sacramento. But when I have good things in Beverly Hills, they come with me. But 30, almost 35 years of having a fellow, you must have some really funny stories about these guys. I have funny stories and endearing things. I remember things about my fellow that, are, um, that really warm my heart still after years and years. Interestingly, I've had three fellows pass away from different things. Yeah, it's, you know, one of them many years ago, the year after his fellowship was in a plane crash going to Mexico to do cleft surgery. And it really a tragic thing. And so, you know, this is life in general. We have the ups and the wonderful things, the meeting friends at meetings like I'm sitting right now with you. And we have the tragedy because that's life, right? Yeah. That's what life is about. So I, I feel really gifted that I'm able to have all these life experiences. And medicine, I think, provides experiences that we wouldn't else have. I've been to maybe 50 countries teaching. It's I wouldn't be able to do this if I were a business yeah. person yeah, yeah, or right. I... You know, I've been all over the world to many countries, many times to many countries. And, I, I, you know, two weeks ago I was in Brazil and at nine o'clock at night they brought me into the operating room and I did a brow lift, eyelids and facelift. We finished at midnight. No way. Yeah. And yeah, I was tired off the plane, but yeah. all of these people were hovering around me, yeah. eager to learn everything yeah. I had. I felt like that's a... That's a thing, that's a gift that somebody gave me yeah. to be able to teach people that want to learn. I stayed awake, <laughs> really in the moment, you know. That's awesome, man. Eh? Yeah, it is awesome. Yeah, I, yeah lo- life is awesome. Yeah, life so, is awesome. so in, in amongst this, I mean, like to run two medical practices, to have fellows, to teach around the world and stuff, the thing I want to get my head around now is this whole winemaking thing. In 2016, this guy that I know and I like, uh, he needed some money and I was interested in wine. I've always been interested in wine. I think you are as well, Cameron. Yes, yes. And uh, he found this 40 acre parcel that had been a winery, but had was relatively not cared for. And we bought this and renovated the whole winery, replanted it and uh, now, we're, we, last year, we made almost 6,000 cases of wine. Wow. And uh, so it's, and it's slowly been growing. We started off with 800 cases and 1,200 cases. And last year, we made, we sell 100% of the wine we make. The brand has become very good. It's called, What's the brand called? It's called Newfound Wines. Yeah. I've given him total reign. I like his style. He chose the name. Uh, we looked at a couple of different names for things. It's like Newfoundland in yes. Canada, Newfound, Newfound Wines. And uh, it, the brand has grown. And we make, we're sitting in Europe here in Verona, Italy. We make almost all, not California wines, but European varietals. So that's what I want to ask you. What other varieties? You so use? we make Grenache, yeah. Movedra, Cunoise. We have a white Semillon. We're just going to, for the first time, make a Cabernet Sauvignon, which is primarily a California wine. Wow. But we're going wow. to do that to, right now. To We make some rosé because it turns over more quickly. Yeah. You know, you have to... And, know. okay, so for the listeners, I mean, this is listened to all around the world. Yeah. How can they get hold of it? Of I guess wines? they can go on and uh, go on the website, www.newfoundwines.com. But I'm not here to sell my wine. No, 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 you're not. I'm not yeah. here for that. The wine is wonderful. It's, it's, it's yeah. amazing. But it's, it, it's uh, interesting that I've been able to grow this. And uh, So did you have to learn like the technical side of actually how to make wines? As Mostly well? I was able to 
employ a really wonderful winemaker yes. named Matt Nauman, who's primarily a farmer from Wisconsin, yeah. but he had been in the wine industry for about 12 or 13 years yeah. and had done all the things at various successful wine wineries and was ready to do his own thing. And so I sort of enabled him and in, in many ways, he enabled me. <laughs> well, I think you, you, you and your team need to come to South Africa yeah. on a bit of wine. Too. I know there's a great wine. My brother's married into a family that own a very successful wine farm in South Africa. Yeah, well, we're, we're successful, but we're not making money yet. We're just about to make a lot of money. Yeah, so. but you know, they say it takes years to be an overnight success. Yes, exactly. You, you know the, the story, what, what's the best way to make a million dollars in the wine industry? Right. Start with two. <laughs> Start with two million. <laughs> I've heard the same with farming. It's actually, it's actually cost me three so far. If you want to actually, make a small fortune, you start with a large, large fortune. fortune. <laughs> yes, exactly. Wow. Okay, so Jonathan, last kind of topic I want to delve into is um, I know you've really become a real expert in the whole area of injectables. Um, what are some of your thoughts in, in terms of this being a more focused on rhinoplasty podcast and where is the space for that in the nose, et cetera, et cetera? Well, let me, before I talk about injection rhinoplasty, I'll, 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 what I, I've always been a teacher and I enjoy teaching. People say, why do you teach? Um, if I do a great rhinoplasty or if I do a great deep plane facelift on 100 people, 93 or 94% will be very satisfied. That's my three to 4% will be dissatisfied and 1% or so, maybe two, will be heavily dissatisfied to the part that they almost threaten me. Yes. And that's true about all of us. It's true about you as a rhinoplasty surgeon. 100% and I yeah. hate that because it's a we, painful thing to and, have to deal with. all of us, it's painful. Yeah. But, but if I do a good job teaching, yeah, 100%, not 98, not 99, will be satisfied. Why is this? So if I do uh, good, about hundred percent. If I do yeah. good surgery, not everybody is satisfied, and a lot of that is the patients. But if I if I teach well, yes. If I teach well, everyone is satisfied. Why the difference? It has to do with the expectations and motivation of the people that you're either teaching or doing surgery on. And the reality of it is we don't really learn the expectations and motivations of our patients well enough. Okay. If we find them out really well, we'll find out who will be happy and who will have the tendency to not be happy. But the motivations and expectations of people that you teach are just to learn. And if you're passionate about teaching, they all will be happy with that. You'll get 100% satisfaction. So how does that bring me to the question that you asked, which was about injectables? Yeah. I saw this niche or void in people that were doing injectables, primarily in the United States, they're nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs. And some of them are physicians who've not been surgeons. Okay. And they don't know anatomy they don't know about the aesthetics quite as well. They, they're learning that on the fly. They're learning that as they go. And specifically for me, I'm an anatomist. I dissect at this later point in my career, at least one cadaver per month, heavily dissected. Sometimes it's two. In the next two weekends, I'll dissect a cadaver and teach both the weekends. And I love teaching anatomy and love the intricacies of anatomy. And it's, it's been a revival for me to be able to teach anatomy to people. And I teach anatomy now to surgeons that think they know it. Wow. And so I dissect and I have a video series on injectable anatomy for injectors yeah, yeah. that I did with QMP. But it's, it's given me a, a revival. And we're always looking to slightly reinvent ourselves. Yeah. This is why many people are embracing the, the bastardized term for preservation, rhinoplasty. It's a new way to do it, and it's reinvigorated rhinoplasty surgeons. It's reinvigorated you and I that have done many, many rhinoplasties. It's a new way to do things. And so we love it. We love the challenge. So we love challenges, and people in medicine love the challenge. 
we, we don't want to do things the same way all the time. We love the new challenge. So for me, who I, I look at myself as a surgeon, as an injector, as a winemaker, and as a teacher, uh, it's a new thing to teach. Yes. So 20 years ago, people didn't want to learn anatomy from me because surgeons don't want to know the anatomy in that kind of way. But injectors need to know the anatomy because yes. they don't know it. They just know this, what's on the skin yeah. and they don't know what's under the skin. So it's been a new place for my career wow. teaching. So that, that's been really wonderful for me. Jeez. You know, sitting here listening to you, I now understand why the guys who have been under your teaching speak so highly of you. It it's really is a gift. Eh? Yeah. Well, we're, we're all lucky to have our lives, yeah. right? We're all lucky. And we can take, we can do with them whatever we want. Yeah. We can retire at 35 and sit at home if we have enough money. But for me... Yeah, but then you're fulfilling your purpose yeah, and working your passion. is never about money. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I want to make a decent amount of money, but it's yeah. not really about money. If you do your job well, you'll likely be successful financially. That's the way I look at it. So it's, uh, I just want to keep evolving. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, there's your, there's your pearl. There are lots yeah. of pearls inside there to, to take. But um, it, I think mull over this, eh? It's, it's, this is the nice thing about doing this podcast recording is to understand what makes these people tick. And Jonathan, from my side and from the listener's side, just a huge thank you, man. Yeah. It's really great to sit here and listen and be inspired. And I hope that you're going to have 12,000 bottles of wine yeah. next year. <laughs> so we, we already we have... We have 6,000 cases, so that's 70,000 bottles. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, let's so make it 12,000 cases. Yeah, it's 12,000 12, cases. <laughs> that sounds good. I Guys, like that. awesome, man. Listen, Thank you, my friend. Come back next week for another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. I'd like to. Maybe we'll just talk about rhinoplasty, an operation I love and have done over 6,000 times. Goodness gracious yeah, me. Yeah. As many rhinoplasties yeah. as cases of wine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, we'll exactly. do it again. Thanks, guys. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.